Uh, we've had a great service so far. Uh, I know Michael and Jasmine are not here who normally direct our worship ministry, but I think Kamani and all of the worship leaders have done a fantastic job this morning. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause. And, uh, you know, I also want to thank, uh, in an incredible way, I want to thank Aleem and Amanda for the incredible job of communion. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you found love in Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the ultimate love. He's the only one that won't let you down. And I'm so thankful that you came back to faith uh, in God. And I want to thank Geraldo for the amazing job. He's uh, growing and raising up. He has a desire to be an evangelist one day. Uh, he's got to learn to remember to pray after he does a communion, though. That, that's the only thing. But uh, we're patient with each other, aren't we? And uh, we're growing. We love you. Great job. I really appreciate the idea of putting a face on our contribution on, and putting a face on uh, our missions as well. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm fired up to be able to uh, preach to you today. I'm looking forward to sharing some things out of God's Word. We're going to begin our series on uh, First and Second Peter. Amen. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this group and I thought, what, what do we really need over the next eight weeks? And I want to encourage you not to miss one message from First and Second Peter. And I thought, I thought, you know, our region is doing well, but we need to get stronger. You can never be strong or solid enough spiritually. Amen, church? And so we've aptly entitled our series, Solid as a Rock. And you know, this morning, some of us not be, may not be feeling solid. A couple of people have had to come up here and say, are y'all out there? I don't hear enough amens out there. That, that might be a sign that you're not as solid as you need to be. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's one thing about me. I, I love to preach the word of God, but you know what I find? I find I do a better job when the people preach back to me. I find that I get more fired up when people say amen. amen. I don't know how many of you saw the U.S. Open yesterday and what happened with Serena, Serena Williams. I felt so bad about her. But you know what I love is that the crowd was engaged. Whenever Serena would pick the ball up, the crowd started cheering. Whenever she'd make a good shot, the crowd would say, Amen, Serena. But if I hold up the word of God, Christians don't say nothing. People are more excited about a tennis ball than we are about a Bible. I want to encourage you to get out of yourself today. Let me just tell you something. You know, I know it's great that we have our quiet times with God uh, every week. We uh, enjoy having our quiet times and studying our Bibles. We enjoy praying throughout the day. But you know, I, I believe God gets the most fired up when we're in the assembly together. I think when God sees Christians coming together on Sunday morning to worship, he gets so excited. But I bet if we're not excited... Maybe God isn't ex as excited. And I want to encourage you to put some energy into my lesson this morning. Put some energy into God. It's not for me. I'm fine. I'm good. I don't need you like that. I want you to do it for God. Are you with me right there? And so we're going to look at first and second Peter. We're going to start with the book of first Peter today. It's considered one of the general gospels, uh, one of the general epistles, excuse me. The letters of uh, the epistles are broken up into uh, the, the uh, epistles that were written directly to churches like 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul's epistles, of course, uh, along um, uh, with Romans and Galatians that he wrote, were written to certain groups of Christians. But Peter and James's epistles are called the general epistles because they're open. They're, they're written to everybody. They were meant to be for those Christians and, and any disciples that would come after them. And so many of the things in First and Second Peter are, are written in that way. Peter left these things behind for us to learn from. 
the examples, the stories were left behind so that he could give general guidance on how New Testament disciples should live their lives for all times. There's 150 verses in 1 Peter. There's five chapters. And the message is the same throughout. Get ready. Stand firm. Live for Jesus. No matter what happens in your life, live for Jesus Christ. No matter how bad it gets, you got to live for Jesus. You know, look over in uh, John chapter 1. We're going to look at a lot of We're not even ready to go. I'm not going to 1 Peter till y'all get excited. So if, I might not even get there during this sermon. I don't know. John chapter 1. I'm not going there until there's enough enthusiasm in the room. John chapter 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Anybody following Jesus just because Jesus says something? They follow Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? You see, Jesus was normal. If I was walking down the street and a couple guys just started following me, I would turn around and be like, dude, what do you want? Why are you following me? And that's what Jesus did. They saw him and they just started walking and filed in line behind Jesus and just started walking behind him. And Jesus says, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come here, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. When's the last time you spent a whole day with Jesus? I'm not talking about Christians that just go to church. I'm talking about Christians. I'm spending a whole day with you, Jesus. I'm taking the day off work. Not to watch old Andy Griffith reruns. I'm taking a whole day off not to play PlayStation all day. I'm taking a whole day off to spend some time with Jesus Christ. Some of you need to do that. Some of y'all just need to say, I'm, I'm calling in sick. I'm sick spiritually. I'm calling in sick today. And I'm spending a whole day in my Bible and praying with God. I wonder how you'd come into church next Sunday if you just spent a whole day with Jesus. Amen, sister. You come up here and sit on the front row. I'm a, I will preach so much better if you're right here saying that. And so they spent the whole day with Jesus. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Boy, what a find. Yeah. What a find. First thing he did, he said, man, I got to go tell my brother about this. Some of y'all still haven't shared your faith with your family. They don't even know you're Christian. You got cousins that don't even know you've been baptized. I'm thankful Andrew wasn't like you as we wouldn't have Peter. First thing he did. I got to go tell my brother, I have found the Messiah. I have found the Christ. Does it make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? It's such good news. Some of us hadn't told anybody, I have found the Christ in a long time. People at your job don't know you found the Christ. They just think you're a nice person. Do your neighbors know you have found the Christ? 
Do your co-workers, do your best friends, does your high school friend who you've not seen in two years, do they know I have found him? Simon Peter said, I got to tell you something. Andrew, I got to tell you something, Peter. Simon, I have found the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated means Peter, which when translated in the Greek means you're the rock. We're not talking about Dwayne Johnson this morning. We're talking about the real rock. That dude isn't the rock. Peter is the rock. He just copied Peter's name. Jesus invented that. He told his brother. Scholars believe that Andrew was actually the older brother of Peter. Scholars would say that Andrew was probably a year even older than Jesus. And so Andrew followed this younger man. Some of y'all can't be discipled by somebody that's younger than you. I really don't care where truth comes from. If it's truth, I'm trying to listen to it. Young brother, get up here in the pulpit. Y'all just shut your ears. Aileen, get up here. Y'all just put your finger in the ear. He's too young to listen to. There is no moratorium on truth. Truth is truth, no matter where it comes from. Don't just listen to me because I'm older than you. I think I'm older than everybody in here. But don't listen to me because I'm older than you. Listen because it's the truth. And so he was older. Jesus saw Simon and he changed his name. You don't look like no Simon to me. You look like a rock. You the rock. What a name. But you know something? Andrew must not look like much to Jesus because Jesus didn't change his name. You was Andrew when I met you, and you still Andrew. <laughs> Be careful about laughing at that. Because you were so-and-so when I met you, and you still so-and-so. Should I call somebody out this morning? Should I name names? Some of y'all are the same person you were when you got baptized. I'm about to name some names. You sitting back there not saying amen. I'm about to name your name. You were John Doe when you got baptized. You still John Doe today. Jesus saw Peter. He said, man, you're the rock. I'm changing your name. I see something special in you. He saw something. In Peter. I see something in Kamani. I always have. Kamani used to just come up here and sing and wouldn't smile at all. <laughs> Kamani up here singing with two hands now. I'm like, okay, smiling, doing an incredible job. I see something in Richard. Okay. Richard used to have his little ponytail on top all up here. Look at him now. Uh, let's just call him Stud Richard. He saw something in him. He changed his name. A few weeks later, maybe days, maybe weeks, we really don't know how much time, but look over in Mark chapter 1. Because they didn't become disciples at this point. 
they met Jesus and they were just following behind him, walking in a straight line, following him and all of that. But that was the first meeting. Andrew introduced him to Jesus. Thank God that there are people in our lives that will introduce yeah. Jesus to us. You know, nobody needs to be better to, at that than us. We need to be great at introducing people to Jesus. You know, last year, I, I saw 15 people come to the Lord last year. All, literally all around different places of the world. This year, I've only seen one person come to the Lord. A young lady that I reached out to uh, over the internet on Craigslist was baptized in the Eugene Amen. Church. Amen. And, and I, I was happy with that. But, but, but lately, my heart is just burning. Just one person that I've helped become a Christian this year personally, that's not enough. I got to do better. I got to repent and see more people. I got to tell more people that I've seen the Messiah. How about you? Mark chapter 1, verse 16. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother, Andrew, casting a net into the lake and they were, uh, because they were fishermen. He said, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and they followed them. This is when they started following Jesus Christ. And Jesus took something that was very familiar to them, which was fishing. Their father was a fisherman. They, they were experts in, in dry in catching fish and drying fish out and selling fish. And what you'll see in Peter's life is many examples of Jesus using fishing to change his heart and change his life. It's no coincidence, all of the fishing lessons. You see, God will often take things from our past. He will often take things that relate to where we are and use it for the rest of our lives to train and to teach us. You know, I grew up in a family that loved fishing. My dad used to love to hunt and fish. I, I hated hunting. To this day, I have a rabbit phobia because my father shot a rabbit and said, go pick up that rabbit. I said, I'm not picking up that rabbit. He literally turned the gun on me. He said, if you don't pick up that rabbit, that rabbit's going to be picking you up. I went over and picked up the rabbit. I didn't want the rabbit picking me up. I went over and picked up the rabbit, and then it shook in my hand. I freaked out. I haven't been able to touch a rabbit foot since. Don't bring no rabbits around me. I'm still not healed from that incident. I'm scared of bunnies. I don't celebrate Easter. Celebrate Jesus, but that bunny don't have nothing to do with Jesus. But my dad used to take us fishing all the time, and, and he loved it. And I, I'd love to go. We'd go out in the boat, and, and he'd go way out in, in, into the lake or river, wherever he would uh, take me and my younger brother to go fishing. And he would always drop an anchor off the side of the boat. And, and we would be fishing, and then when it would get rough, because in Indiana, you know, it storms, thunderstorms real heavily, and hails and wind blow all and beat all up against the boat. And he would never go in. Once you were on the lake, you were either going to fish till it was dark, or you were going to die out there. And so we would be out there in some tumultuous storms all the time. I mean, fishing, and I'm like, Dad, come on, man. I'm going to shoot you if you try to get... I mean, that's just how my dad was. And we would be out there on the boat fishing and, and learning all of these lessons. And, and I was just so thankful for one mighty lesson. Is that as long as we were anchored, yeah. no matter how bad the hell got, no matter how bad the storms got, no matter how hard the wind, as long as we were anchored, we were okay. Amen. You know, and that's a spiritual lesson that has stuck with me all of my life. Amen. You can clap on that. You know, as long as I'm anchored... I'm okay. You know, what's your, what's your anchor spiritually? What's my anchor? Peter's going to teach us that our spiritual anchor is our faith. It really doesn't matter what we go up against. As long as we hold on to our faith, we'll be solid. Well, before, y'all still aren't ready to go to 1 Peter yet. I was about to go, but I'm not going. I want to talk a little bit about Peter. You know, it's one thing to read something that someone writes, yeah. 
It's another thing to learn something about the author. I find that the more you know about the author, the more you're able to extract or to understand about the author's words. So let's learn a little bit about Peter. We know he got his name changed right away. Not everybody got their name changed. We know that. We knew he was a younger brother. He wasn't the older brother. He was younger than Andrew. He was an apostle who would later become the leader of the 12. He was a fisherman. And Jesus would use lessons about fishing and fish and water to train him and teach him his entire life. And God will often take our past and use it and bring us back to it to learn deeper and deeper and deeper lessons. How many of you here have, were, were abandoned by a, a, a dad or, or, or experienced some kind of hurt in your life and God keeps bringing you right back to that to teach you deeper and deeper and deeper lessons. Some of us get discouraged. Oh God, why are you doing that? I want to forget that. Shut up. I got some lessons for you to learn. I've got some things I want to teach you. And I'm going to use everything I put you through. So that you can learn where you're going. Amen. Look over in Luke chapter 5. Let's learn some things about Peter. What a guy. What an amazing, amazing guy. He wasn't always this rock. He was something else before he was a rock. He was a rock in progress when Jesus made him. But thank God Jesus was looking way on down there. You know, in the early days of his life, he might have just been a pebble. Some of you are at the pebble stage and you mad because you're not a rock. You're going to get there. Just let yourself be discipled and trained. Let people get into your life. Come to the leaders meeting. How are you going to be a rock and you won't even come to a leaders meeting? You're a pebble and you're always going to be a pebble. Luke chapter 5. In verse 1 through 3, Jesus is preaching and teaching to the people from uh, the shore. They finish. He sends the apostles over to the other side of the lake. Um, he, he sat down. Uh, he sat and taught them from the boat. And then he finishes up in verse 4. We'll pick up there. When he had finished speaking, he said to who? Simon. I thought you said he called him the rock. He did, but he's a rock in the making. He's still Simon right now. Put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when he had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners and the other boats to come and help. And they came and filled both boats so full that, they, the, nets began, that the boats began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. First thing we notice about our author of this amazing book is that he was an obedient man. Oh, he's still a pebble at this point, but he was an obedient pebble. He was obedient. He was a fisherman. He was the expert, not Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter by trade. And so here you have a carpenter telling a school legacy fisherman about fish. And he says, go on back out there and let down your nets. Peter was like, um, yo, man, ain't, ain't, ain't no fish out there. Fish aren't biting. You know, if you're a fisherman and you fished all night and the fish aren't biting, you're not trying to fish anymore. How many of you like to fish when the fish aren't biting? I don't. The fish weren't biting. And Peter knew it. But Jesus said, and he told Jesus, there's no fish over there. Any of us ever been faithless like that? 
Jesus tell us to go share our faith and you go, ain't no fish over there. Ain't nobody open over there. Oh, stuck up people. They're not open. We're all faithless in the beginning. And it's okay to tell Jesus when we're faithless. Man, ain't no open people at USC. We've been on that campus all year. Ain't no open people in my neighborhood, in my community. Everybody I reach out to says no to me. Maybe you're the problem, not the gospel. Jesus says, fish again. Can you fish again, brothers and sisters? Can we go fishing this next week? I know people haven't been open lately. Can you fish again? Will you throw the nets out again for the Lord? You know, it's time for us to grow in Metro Heights. It's time for us to see a great catch. And so Peter says, Lord, because you say so. You know, sometimes as a Christian, we just got to do it because he says so. You know, missions is that kind of time. Come on. I really don't have missions money right now. I, I really don't. But because you say so. Come on, bro. I'm going to find a way to get the missions. Amen. It's a lot of things we don't feel like doing sometimes as Christians. But can we have a because you say so spirit when it comes to Jesus? Can we commit that we're going to be that kind of church here in the Metro Heights region? And so Peter was obedient. Don't you love that about Peter? You know, second thing is that Peter was colorful. I mean, what a colorful. Don't you like people with colorful personalities? Who's our colorful brother in the, in, in the Metro Heights region? Isn't it Ricky Ball? I mean, don't. Is it? I mean, Ricky just had, Ricky's got a little bit of Peter color, colorfulness in him. What an what a awesome, colorful brother. Look over in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I might not get to 1 Peter today. The time's just going, it's going too fast. But we can't, you, you can't understand the letter unless you understand the author. Mark chapter 1, uh, chapter 6, pardon me. Mark chapter 6. Peter was colorful. I, I love that about Peter. Look in verse 47. Again, another example from his past, fishing on the boat, on the water. Verse 47, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And so the disciples were out in the middle of the boat, and they were straining at the oars. You know what I call these kind of Christians? Canoe Christians. Uh -oh. Any canoe Christians in here? You know what a canoe Christian is? A canoe Christian is a Christian that won't get moving unless you paddle them. Oh. Don't be a canoe Christian. And so they were straining at the oars. And the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them. And what is the darkest point of the night is right before dawn. And so this was the darkest part of the night. And Jesus goes out to them walking on the lake. I don't think this was an accident. I think Jesus' intent was to scare the life out of them. <laughs> you ever do that as a parent? I used to scare my kids all the time when they were little. They would walk around the corner and I'd jump, boo! And, they, I, and I used to love scaring them. Can I confess some sin? I scare Emma all the time. She's so scary. It's so much fun. You know, but Jesus went out there walking on the lake at the darkest part of the night. He goes on and it says... He was about to pass them by. I, I have so little time, but I got to talk about this right here. Because, you know, if you're not careful, 
Jesus will just walk right by you. He will. These were his apostles. He was walking and he was about to walk right by them. What did they have to do? It says, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. I think that was Jesus' desired effect. I think he wanted to scare them. He was about to walk right by them. But they noticed him. Do you notice Jesus? You notice him in the fellowship today? Notice him in your households? You feel the spirit of God in the mornings when you wake up. Is the first thing you do is get on your knees and go to your God. We got to stop letting Jesus walk by in our lives, disciples. We've got to stop and we've got to take note. The Bible says he was about to walk by. They saw him and they were afraid. He said, take courage. It is I. Don't be Afraid, Amen. There's nothing we have to be afraid about when it comes to the Christian life. On, Some of us as Christians live in perpetual fear of what we don't have or what our future is or the man we haven't met yet that we want to marry. You better keep waiting. She'll end up with the wrong guy. Stop trying to make it happen. Stop trying to do it for God and trust and let God do it. For you, there is nothing to fear. You're going to get married. And when you do, you, you might, some mornings you might wish you weren't married. You're going you're gonna to find your spouse in the kingdom. We might baptize somebody this week that you end up marrying. Just let God do it. Are you with me, church? Amen. Let's stop worrying. Let's stop worrying about what we don't have. You're going to find that God's got a job for you. You really don't think God can get you a job? Are you serious? Come on, bro. So I don't have a household. You'll get one. Are you going to keep it clean? <laughs> Let's stop worrying and spending our lives in fear. Peter was incredibly colorful. Look over in Matthew 14. Let me show you the sister passage of this because that passage actually leaves a lot of details out. Matthew 14. That's your favorite scripture? Matthew 14. There's a little more detail. Look in verse 25. He says, shortly before dawn, Jesus was out with them. Uh, Jesus uh, went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. In verse 28, then Peter, Peter got his swag on right here. Lord, isn't this something Ricky Ball would do? Lord, if it is you, Ricky replied. Tell me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus just simply said, come. And do you know what Ricky did? Ricky got down out of the boat and walked on the water and he came to Jesus. Peter was so colorful. Everybody else was sitting all back in the boat, scared, sitting down, looking, all trembling in the corner, all curled up. Peter jumped up and said, if it's you, tell me to get out of this boat and come and walk. Jesus says, come. You know what I noticed here is there was only one apostle that was colorful enough and daring enough to stand up. Are you that one? Or are you the other 11 sitting back in the corner of the boat trembling with fear? Peter got up, got out of the boat. He, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I get in the water, I like just stick my toe in first. I get in so slow, it takes me forever to get in all the way. Some people just jump right. I hate those people. They just jump right in the water like that. I'm like, what is wrong with you? 
But I, you know, I, it takes me a while. I think Peter just jumped out of the boat, stepped and started splashing on the top of the water. You know how you have to check it out to make sure it's solid. I bet he stood there for about five minutes splashing in the water and then he walked forward to Jesus. And then he looked around and he saw the waves and the winds and he got scared. But aren't you proud that he got out of the boat? You know, sometimes when you do daring things for God and you get out there, the winds and the waves are going to come in. But what's your anchor? Your faith in Jesus. And when Peter got in that situation, look at what he does. In verse 31, uh, verse 30, it says, But when he saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid and he began to sink. Anybody ever start sinking in here spiritually? Anybody sinking today? Don't raise your hand. Sometimes, some of you might even be sinking today. You're like, my nose is just barely up at church today. I'm, I'm hanging in here. I'm sinking. And Peter was sinking. I've had periods in my life where I was sinking as a Christian. And if you've been a Christian any time long, you, 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 you've been sinking too. He said that when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to be afraid and he began to sink. But he cried out, Lord, save me. This is the most powerful prayer in the Bible. It's a prayer that we need to use every day. Lord, save me. Can you say, go and tell your neighbor, Lord, save me. Save me. What a prayer. This is a prayer that God always answers. Certainly right here, verse 31. What does it say here? A week later, 10 days later, a month, next year. No, it says immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. If you're struggling spiritually, it's your fault. My Bible tells me when we say this prayer, when we call out to Jesus for help, when we say, Lord, help me. Jesus immediately answers this prayer. And stretches out his hand to you. Says Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. Anybody in Jesus' hand today? Anybody need to be pulled out of anything today? So thankful that we have a God that pulls us out. And then he says, why did you doubt? He still holds him accountable. Why did you doubt? I'm here. I got you. Some of us need to hear that today. We're worried about stuff. Yeah. Jesus says, I got you. Amen. So colorful. Look over in. Um, he was colorful, but he was also complex. Got any complex people in your life? You've been trying to understand them. You can't. What are you talking about, bro? I don't understand you. You're, you're too complex. Where my complex Christians at? It's okay if you're complex. You know, you know some of y'all know you're complex. Peter had a little bit of complexity in his life. Look over in John chapter 13. Come on, bro. I am preaching so slow today. My goodness. I, I haven't even gotten through like a half, a, a fourth of a lesson. Uh, look over in um, John chapter 13. Because you can't understand the message unless you understand the messenger. John 13. He was obedient. He was colorful. He was complex before he became the rock. In John 13 and verse 6. This is when Jesus is about to wash their feet. In verse 6 it says, He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? <laughs> Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. You have some disciples who don't really understand the discipling you're giving them today. Yeah, right. eh, why are you talking to me like that? Why are you asking me? To, you don't really understand what we're doing. But you're going to understand later. In verse 8, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Be careful telling Jesus what he'll never do in your life. You can learn. Well, you know, as my, my parents used to say, 
I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say it. <laughs> a hard head makes a soft what? That's what I was going to say. They said it a little differently when I was growing up, but it still means the same thing. I got the message. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Some of us don't like taking spiritual baths. Jesus says, I got to wash you if you want to have a part of me. There's some you're still stuck in the study series. You're at discipleship. You've seen light and darkness. You see all that sin in your life. And Jesus says, I got to wash you. Else you have no part in me. If you've been washed in Jesus, say amen. Yeah. Isn't it great to get a Jesus bath? In verse 9, then the, Lord, then, then, the, then the Lord, Simon Peter replied, No, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You ever have a brother that's just extra? <laughs> no, Peter, Peter all extra right here. Jesus said, I just, I need to wash your hands and feet. Look what Jesus says in verse 10. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. You know, Peter was complex. He was very complex. He was impetuous. You know, wash my, don't just wash my feet. Wash all of me. I, I need it all. I, I'm just extra. I'm over the top. I need it all done. You know, sometimes we can take a good thing and go too far with it. We can just be extra, just, just over the top with something that's good. You know, I appreciated my son. He started dating uh, last weekend. And uh, I was ta he, he called me yesterday and I said, hey, how's it going? Oh, he, oh, it's going great. It's going great. And it's perfect. It's awesome. Da, 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 all this stuff. And uh, he says, but, but, you know, we've been talking like every day. And I'm like, what? You've been talking every day? You, are, you look, might be a little extra right here. You know, I'm thinking to myself, my son might be a little extra right here. Yeah, we're texting and we're in and on. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm just listening, you know, setting. I'm getting ready to go in for the kill. You know, I'm getting ready to go in right here on some serious discipling on my son. And he goes, and, and yeah, I'm so excited about our D time. Uh, this, this upcoming week, we're, we're getting with uh, uh, one of the uh, couples that's going to be uh, discipling us. And we're going to have a boundaries D time. I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> a boundaries D time. And I said, what's going to happen in the boundaries D time? Oh, they're going to tell us how much we should talk, how much we should do this, how much we should do that. And I just thought, amen. When's the last time you had a boundaries D time? We need people in our lives to make sure we don't just get extra as a Christian. Jesus had a boundaries D time here with Peter. Look over in Mark chapter 9. I'm going to talk for about four more minutes. We'll get to the next part of it later. Amen? Amen. Got to know the author before you can know the message. And so he was obedient. He was colorful. He was complex. Mark chapter 9, we see another characteristic of Peter. The pebble at this point. In Mark chapter 9, say amen when you get there. Oh, y'all are getting tired on me. Y'all are getting all tired. Imagine this as a tennis ball. What would you do? If I hold up a tennis ball, you're going to... you more fired up about a tennis ball, you're more fired up about this. Amen. Mark chapter 9. Jesus shows Peter something very, very special. It's a very special time. Only his inner circle of guys got to experience this. Verse 2, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. Let me just tell you something here. Don't, don't, ever under, don't underestimate those special moments, those special points of access when you get time with people. Leaders' meetings are so special. They're... they're, they're special times sometimes getting time with with certain people 
our, our special times. I remember when I was in the business world, I had an opportunity to meet Warren Buffett. And I just thought, wow, this is Warren Buffett. I remember when I got to meet Nelson Mandela in South Africa, I was like, wow, this is, this is Nelson Mandela. I met Colin Powell at the Joint Chiefs of Staff when he was about to go out of office. I was there at the National Breakfast Club. I shook his hand, I went up to give him a hug and the Secret Service was about to kill me. I forgot what I was doing, I was so excited. I remember one time I was at a White House event and I got a chance to meet Rosa Parks. Wow. Went up to Rosa. I'm like, this Rosa Park. Can I sit down next to you, Rosa? And I, re I remember reaching out my hand and I, I, I shook Rosa Parks' hand. Wow. And I thought, man, this was, how many people get to meet, how many of y'all have met Rosa Parks? <laughs> I'm like, I just met Rosa Parks. It was incredible. I remember meeting Barack Obama. Yeah. I met Bill Clinton. I shook Bill Clinton's hand. I mean, Bill Clinton's got the biggest, softest hands I've ever shaken in my life. I'm like, dang, Bill. You haven't worked a day in your life. That's what, literally what I felt like. I thought you have never worked before. Don't underestimate the special people that you get to meet. Some of you are discipled by some amazing people. Man, when you get time with James and Jennifer. Oh yeah. Listen, James and Jennifer are so special. You get time with Aaron and Sheila. So, so special. I remember the first time I met Sheila. I thought you remind me of Rosa Parks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I so enjoy meeting Jane, uh, uh, Aaron and Sheila. You get time with Avery Blackwell. You get time with Casey. Ooh. Casey's amazing. She's got the biggest smile in the king. I've never seen her not smiling. You get time with Amanda, the, the ex atheist. AJ and CL. Every disciple in here is so special. Yeah. I wouldn't trade any of you away for anybody. God is good. And so Peter goes up on the mountain. In verse 6, it says, Six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, led them up to the high mountain where they were alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them was Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And again, Peter speaks up. And he said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Peter was living life to the full. Peter was living it up. I mean, some of you, you, you have such amazing lives, but you're so afraid to live life to the full as a Christian. Peter said, man, this is awesome. It's good to be here. Let's put up three, let's build some cribs up here. <laughs> Said, man, I just want to build my house up here. You know, that's how we want church to feel. You come here, you come in the fellow, man, it is so amazing to be, I just, can I just move into the breath of life? Can I just move in with y'all, Chris? Can I just be with y'all all the time? 
Some of you are so light, you're so bright, nobody could even bleach your spirit to be that bright. It's amazing. Let's just stay here. Let's build us three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Where, where are you going to sleep, Peter? He was so into it, he forgot about his own house. It's like, man, I'm just going to sleep out on the ground. I just want to be up here and look at y'all's cabins that we built. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. You know, I, I imagine this kind of being like the Wizard of Oz moment. You know, and they, 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 the lion and Dorothy and the tin man, and they all go in there and they see the wizard and he's back there doing all of this stuff and they see him and they just don't know what to do. They're scared, but they're, they're around this great power. That's how God is. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. Every experience we have spiritually is a mountaintop experience. Let me tell you something. I, I, I grew up with six generations of Protestant preachers. But when I came to and I heard the truth, it was amazing. Please don't misunderstand or underestimate what you have. God has brought you to the truth. There's so many people out there trying to experience religion and they don't even know what baptism is. And yet God has brought you into the true kingdom of God. And we need to decide today that we're going to make, like Peter, we need to decide that we're going to make this our home. That's what Peter was saying. This is my home right here. I ain't going nowhere. I'm rocking with Jesus and Moses. I, I, I can't even, I mean, they're spirits, but I'm rocking with the spirits. I'm, I'm rocking with these guys. I'm home. You feel like you're at home today yeah. as a Christian? Because yeah. this is it. This is it throughout eternity. Yeah. It's us. Yeah. I'm going to be seeing you, Carlos, forever. <laughs> forever. It's me and you be seeing you forever. Kiki? I mean like Kiki, you remember when I preached that sermon on Peter? You boy, that was so long ago. We up here in heaven now. Why are you still talking about that? I'm gonna be seeing you forever. We're family forever. Amen. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures and then I'm gonna sit down. So just just for your outline, he, he was open he was colorful. He was complex. He lived life to the full. He was open. Matthew chapter 13. He says, who do the people say? I mean, he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He was open. He understood that. Uh, he was also loyal. John chapter 6. He was loyal. Jesus said, you know, when the, when the priest came to take Jesus, uh, Peter was there. They came with their clubs and their swords. And, and Peter was loyal to Jesus. He was ready to fight to, for his life. In fact, he was the one who pulled out the sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear. That was Peter. Jesus says, come on, man. Stop cutting off people's ears. <laughs> Jesus grabbed the ear, put it back on the dude, and healed him. Stop. Stop, Peter. But Peter was loyal. Don't you want to be discipled by somebody that's loyal like that? I mean, I wish somebody would mess with me when I'm with Aaron. And Aaron might take you out if you messing with me. There was a brother messing with me one meeting. He jumped up. I said, don't touch me. Aaron, don't touch you. Aaron was ready to grab that brother. Peter cut off his ear, and Jesus said, Peter, dang, ugh. <laughs> Look over in um, Mark, and then we'll finish with this passage. He was so loyal. Are you loyal? Are you loyal to Jesus? Would you cut somebody's ear off for the Lord? Would you cut somebody's head off for Jesus? I would. I 
I'll rebuke you so hard, you'll, you feel like your head got cut off. <laughs> you start talking crazy about Jesus. Would you do that? Would you defend Jesus? Mark chapter 14. It's our last passage. We'll get into 1 Peter next time. But at least you know who he is now, right? Mark chapter 14. I love verse 29. Peter declares, even if all fall away, I will not. That's what loyalty is all about right there. Can we say that this morning? If everybody else fell away, I ain't falling away. Come on, bro. I'm here with you forever. Every year I make that vow to God. I'm not falling away in 2018. Nope. Say, why don't you make it forever? I've made it forever, but I think it's good to just make it every year too. I'm not falling away in 2018. How many are going to be here for 2019? Yeah. Anybody going to fall away this year? Don't fall away this year. Verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. This was one of the toughest moments in Jesus' life. Verse 33, Peter took James and John along with him. I mean, he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, if it is possible, uh, uh, that if it is possible, uh, may this hour pass for me. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. If, if Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Can we say that, brothers and sisters? Not what we want, but what God wants in our lives. Verse 37, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. And we don't know if they were all sleeping, but we know Peter was sleeping. Because Jesus said, so Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? What kind of friend are you? I'm at the toughest point in my life. I brought you here with me and you're asleep. You know, if you're a disciple in this generation, this is the toughest time in the history of the gospel. Are we awake or are we asleep? Come on. Verse 28, 38, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And of course, they, they arrest Jesus, the Sanhedrin arrest him. They take him and in verse um, 62, they ask him who he is, if he is actually the Christ. In verse 62, he says, I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes why do we need to hear? Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. And this is something I had never seen before in this passage, in verse 65. Then some began to spit on him. But what I had never seen is that next sentence they blindfolded him. You know, they, 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 Jesus actually was blindfolded, standing in the Sanhedrin while this was going on. They, they, I don't know if they tied something around his eyes. The scriptures doesn't say. They just simply say he was blindfolded. And here was Jesus standing out there blindfolded, and they were spitting on him. And they struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. And imagine being there, being blindfolded, being spit on and beaten and hidden with clubs and not knowing if at any moment someone might take a spear and chuck it right through your heart because you couldn't see. And this was blow away to me because this was perhaps emotionally even more traumatizing than the cross. His eyes are closed. He's blindfolded. He's standing in front of this mob for you and for me. And for Peter. In verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need to hear any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. They began to spit on him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with their fist. They said, prophesy. 
and the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls, the high priest, came to him. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with uh, the Nazarene, Jesus, she replied, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. You know, I believe this was perhaps the apex moment when Simon finally stopped being Simon. He got to a point, he was obedient, he was colorful, he was complex. He was full of life, he was open, he was loyal, but he was also human. And at one of the most important moments in his life, he denied Jesus. He said, I don't know the man. Something that he said in a few verses earlier, I will never disown you. And then the rooster crowed. What are the roosters doing in your life today? Are they crowing? Are they cockle doodle doing at our unfaithfulness? Peter would learn from this lesson, and when Jesus would come back, he would feed Jesus' sheep forever. The letter of 1 and 2 Peter came from somebody who learned a lot of lessons from Jesus, who was a guy just like us with all of our complexities, all of our challenges all of our desires to be the people that God wants us to be. But he was a guy that had his faith anchored. No matter what the rooster said, Peter stayed anchored. Let's stay anchored as we look into the books of First and Second Peter. Now you know the man, now you're ready to hear the story. To God be the glory. Come on.